let's go to our the person you're really here to hear. Uh, Hi, uh, thanks, thanks for coming, or thanks for coming back. And uh, as soon as I s get started, I tend to um, go on a roll. So while I'm still in possession of my faculties, uh, let's, there were a couple of things I want to mention. One is, um, one of the uh, priests here pointed out that while I was waving around this book last night and reading from it, I didn't mention that I had written it. I don't know if that's true or not, but there you have it. I, I, the answer is, yeah, I did. Um, uh, the other thing is, I did find a couple more copies of Salvation is from the Jews. I, I had run out last night, but I came across a few more copies, so they'll be downstairs if anyone wants. And, um, okay, so that's it for the housekeeping. Tonight's talk is uh, going to revolve around, as I said the very first night, that the Catholic Church and Judaism are not really too separate religions as much as they are two phases of the same plan for salvation. A first phase to enable the incarnation of the second person of God as man, the most holy trinity as a man, and then a second phase to spread the fruits of that salvation for all mankind throughout the world. And um, th that's why um, I don't, <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't think I betrayed anything. You know, I, I spent 25 years in Boston, and if I became a Yankees fan, then I would have been a traitor. But I don't think I, I became a traitor by going from being Jewish to entering the Catholic Church, because I went from being uh, a Jew who had kind of missed the boat about what the purpose of Judaism was to a Jew who actually followed Judaism through the transition that it always intended and became a follower of the Jewish Messiah. You know, hardcore Jews today think of themselves as followers of the Jewish Messiah, but they reject Jesus because they don't recognize that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Being right about who, Jesus being the Jewish Messiah didn't make me stop being Jewish or make me being a traitor, make me be a traitor to being Jewish. So anyway, I mentioned that the first night. Let me just start tonight with reading a few quotes from other Jewish Catholics just to show that um, I may be eccentric, but I'm not unique in it. And in fact, this is the experience of every Jew I've ever heard of who's entered the Catholic Church. Uh, the chief rabbi of Rome, by the way, during World War II, chief, uh, chief rabbi Israel Zoli became, entered the Catholic Church after the war. He became an extremely um, passionate uh, entrant or convert into the Catholic Church. He was also, by the way, a close friend of Pope Pius X. He was such a close friend of Pope Pius X that he took the name Eugenio as his baptismal name, which is the first name of Pius X. Anyway, he said, Christianity is the integration, completion, or crown of the synagogue, for the synagogue was a promise, and Christianity is the fulfillment of that promise. Uh, Cardinal Lustiger, who was the Cardinal Archbishop of Paris, until he died in uh, 2007. He was also a Jewish convert. And um, here's a quote from him. I explained to my father that baptism would not make me abandon my Jewish condition. Quite the contrary. It would lead me to find it, to receive the fullness of its meaning. I did not have the feeling that I was betraying my heritage or abandoning anything whatsoever. Just the opposite. I felt that I was going to find the import, the meaning of what I had received at birth. I did nothing more than begin to enjoy the heritage that had been promised to me. Christianity is the continuation of Judaism. Christianity is the fruit of Judaism. Until the Messiah is coming in glory, the Jew remains, and he remains a Jew, whether he is in the church or not. I'll talk about that more near the end of uh, this evening. Um, okay, Arthur Kleiber, he's in... He's in uh, Honey from the Rock, but I didn't mention him last night. He's, he's a, a contemporary. He probably died uh, maybe about 20 years ago. My baptism was followed by an intense interior joy which defies description. A Jew has be, who has become a Christian loves his people more than ever. He wishes for them with all his heart the saving faith which he himself has received. Completed Jews have become what all Jews expect to become when the Messiah arrives. And finally, and I'll, I'll end this little 
thing with her. Uh, Rosalind Moss, who's now known as uh, Mother Miriam of the Lamb of God. Some of you may be familiar with her from Catholic Radio or EWTN. Um, in the fullness of Judaism, which is the Catholic Church, I have all that God has given in giving us his church, the sacraments, the communion of saints, and the Jewish mother of the Jewish Messiah. Christianity is not a Gentile religion. It is a Jewish religion that was given to encompass the entire world and every soul in it. Can we love the Jewish people and withhold from them knowledge of the very deliverer they gave to the world? So that's by way of a preface of tonight's talk. Um, and uh, um, uh, I don't know whether I should do this, whether I, whether I should give a, like a, uh, I'll, I'll give a, a four minute synopsis of something I said the first night, which is the role of Judaism in the first half of salvation history between the Garden of Eden and the coming of Christ. And I have my watch in front of me, so I'll try to make it four minutes. Because uh, I, 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 I did this uh, a little bit the first night. So basically, here's the story. The story is that when God originally created man, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, he created him to live in a state of uninterrupted bliss and intimacy with God for all eternity, right? No death, no suffering, um, no pain, even no work, and so forth. When man chose sin, to chose to sin, that original exalted relationship between God and man was shattered, and man fell. But God knew at that very moment that not only would he restore man to that original exalted state at some point in the future, but would actually elevate him to an infinitely higher state through the incarnation of the second person of the most holy trinity as a man at a future point in time. If the second person of the most holy trinity was going to incarnate at a future point in time, it would be among a particular people in a particular place in the world uh, at a particular point in time and even in the womb of a particular virgin and that people would have to be prepared. They would have to be separated out from all the other people wandering the face of the earth and kept separate for about 2,000 years to receive a tremendous amount of divine revelation, to know about the one true uncreated creator God, to know about the creation of man, the fall of man, the uh, seriousness of sin, the need for redemption, the future coming of a redeemer, and so forth. They would have to be given enough background in theology to understand what was happening. They would have to be given enough prophecy to recognize the Redeemer when he came. And they would have to be raised up in a, to a state of morality sufficient so that they could produce a virgin of such purity and nobility that she could give her flesh and blood to be the flesh and blood of God when he became man. And that's... First of all, you guys all know that's the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? And um, that is what the Jews were chosen for. And, and somebody had to do that. If you think of the, of the whole plan of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity incarnating, of course a people had to be chosen and had to be prepared. Now, you could ask, why on earth did God choose the Jews? There's an old uh, ditty, how odd of God to choose the Jews. Um, and uh, God himself gives us the answer in Genesis, at least one reason why he chose the Jews. It's in, it's in Ezekiel. Um, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite. On the day you were born, your navel string was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor swathed with bands. And when I passed you by and saw you weltering in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Your beauty was made perfect through the splendor which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. So God is comparing the Jewish people to an infant who was considered so worthless that it was discarded after birth, not even washed of the afterbirth. And God came along and, and raised up this infant and washed it off and raised it and clothed it in silk and jewels and so forth until it became a, a creature of splendor. So he's saying that precisely to point out to the Jews that you, you can lay credit to nothing. There was nothing special about you. I chose you because you were the most worthless and insignificant of people. And in fact, as Catholics, we know that that's who God chooses for his extraordinary graces, right? We know Bernadette of Lourdes 
was illiterate when the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to her, the children at Fatima, um, and so forth. And, and, and St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, who received the uh, apparition of the Divine Heart, the, uh, excuse me, the Sacred Heart apparitions, um, she asked Jesus at one point, she said, why me? Why did you choose me for this honor? And Jesus said, that's very simple. If I could have found anyone else more worthless and insignificant than you, I would have chosen her instead. <laughs> so that is, that is um, you know, the Jews were chosen to bring salvation to all of mankind through the incarnation of God as man, but not because of any merit or, or virtue of their own, but simply because they were insignificant and so forth. Um, however, um, well, there are two ways to look at this. Okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump forward, I guess, which is, um, yeah, I'll just make an abrupt transition. What the heck? Um, okay, why should a Catholic be interested in the Old Testament? Why should a Catholic be interested in Judaism and the Jews? And there are a lot of different answers to that. One is that, um, uh, as I will close tonight's talk with, the second coming can't happen until there's a conversion of the Jews. So that's a pretty good reason to care about the conversion of the Jews. But in fact, seen through the eyes of Christianity, the story of the Jews in the Old Testament is an incredibly beautiful picture of God's, you could say prophecy, of salvation history to come, a foreshadowing of salvation history to come. And this begins with the very, very, very beginning of the Jewish people. <laughs> I, I wish this was a classroom and I could ask, okay, who was the first Jew? Somebody shouted out. Abraham, is that what I heard? I'll pretend I heard Abraham. I, I didn't, didn't hear it clearly. <laughs> yes, Abraham. Abraham was the father of the Jewish people. The promise that God made um, to Abraham and his descendants forever was the institution of Judaism and the institution of the Jewish people. Now, what did Abraham do to, um, to earn, earn this promise, to get this promise? It's not a coincidence that the cover of my book, Salvation is from the Jews, is a picture of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. You all know the story from, from Genesis, right? I will read a, a short synopsis of that story and then I'll, I'll talk about it, but the point that I'm making, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little um, you know, uh, taste of things to come, is that you'll see this incredibly beautiful parallel between the birth of Judaism and the birth of Christianity that shows that in some sense, I don't want to say they're mirror images of each other, but that Judaism was a foreshadowing of Christianity. So let me read the story from Exodus. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, Abraham replied, here I am. God said, take your only son, your only beloved son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took his son, Isaac, and went to the place God had told him. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and they both went together up the mountain. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, I see the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. When they came to the place God had told him, Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar bound upon the wood. Then Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. The angel said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, 
your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will multiply your descents as the stars of heaven, and your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. That final line, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, was always understood in Christianity and Judaism as the promise that God made to Abraham to send the Messiah through his descendants. Uh, now, the, the mountain which was called the Mount Moriah in the Old Testament, um, anyone know where it is? Jerusalem. Did I hear Jerusalem? Or do I have to pretend I heard Jerusalem? <laughs> yeah, it's in Jerusalem. And the mountain where uh, Mount, Mount Calvary, Mount Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. Anyone know where that is? Yes, of course, Jerusalem. And in fact, there are two names for the same mountain. If you go to Jerusalem, you can go to the spot where Abraham bound Isaac. It's on the Temple Mount. And you can walk 500 yards down the same mountain ridge to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus was crucified. As Abraham laid the wood for Isaac's sacrifice, his only beloved son's sacrifice, on his shoulders and led him up the mountain and bound him to the wood. God laid the wood for, um, on the shoulder, for his sacrifice on the shoulders of his only beloved son, Left, led him up the very same mountain and bound him to the wood. When, when Isaac said, I, I see the wood and the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? When Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son, he was speaking prophetically far more deeply than he knew because God himself did provide the lamb for the sacrifice, the true sacrifice, who is Jesus. The entire picture of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac was a picture in advance of the true sacrifice which would bring redemption to all of mankind. The, the lamb that was, the ram that was caught in, a, in the thicket by its horns, which is offered as a temporary substitute, was the first Jewish sacrificial lamb to which every subsequent Jewish sacrificial lamb pointed. Every Jewish sacrificial lamb from that point on simultaneously pointed back to the lamb that was substituted for Isaac and forward to the true lamb of sacrifice, who is Jesus. And you all know, of course, that Jesus is called over and over and over again, the lamb of God, behold the lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So you can see how the entire, the entire story, so to speak, of the birth of Judaism was a foreshadowing of the story of the birth of Christianity. Does that make sense? And I, I'm, I'm only going to go, you know, I, I have, you know, I have an hour here, and um, there's, there's, you know, there, there literally, of course, there's material for 20 hours here. So what I'm trying to do is just give a little, a little like, uh, you know, like one of those uh, appetizer tables of, you know, you take a, what are they called, tapas or something, you take a little bite of this and a little bite of that and a little bite of that. Um, so, but I'm gonna give another little tapa in the same realm of foreshadowings in Judaism, which is the central, Okay, actually, both of these are really important to do, and you'll, I hope I'll remember to point out why when I get to the end. Um, the, the central event in Judaism is the exodus from Egypt. The um, central liturgy in some ways, only in some ways, but in some ways in Judaism, is the Passover Seder, the celebration of the Passover Seder, which is a commemoration of the exodus from Egypt. The uh, celebration of the Passover Seder is so important and so serious that it says in the Old Testament that if any Jew fails to celebrate the Passover Seder and eat of the Paschal lamb, of the lamb that's offered at the Passover Seder, he will lose his share in the world to come. He loses his membership among the Jewish people. That's how central the Passover Seder is. You stop being a Jew if you don't celebrate the Passover Seder and eat of the Passover sacrifice. Now, the Passover Seder, as I said, commemorates the exodus from Egypt. What happened in the exodus from Egypt? Okay, the Jews were slaves of the Pharaoh in Egypt. God raised up a deliverer, Moses, to free the, the, the Jews from Pharaoh. 
Um, Moses performed a series of miracles before Pharaoh, and finally he let them go. And uh, as they were fleeing uh, from, from the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh changed his mind and sent the army after them. The Jews reached the shores of the Red Sea. They were trapped. They were about to be killed. When the, shore, uh, the Red Sea parted miraculously, the Jews crossed the Red Sea. Then the waters came back. It drowned the Pharaoh's army. Then the Jews found themselves in the desert. So they were wandering the desert for 40 years. They obviously ran out of food to eat. God gave them manna from heaven, the miraculous bread from heaven, to sustain them in the desert in their wandering. They wandered in the desert for 40 years until they finally made it to the promised land, to Israel, to the old Jerusalem. Now, that picture was seen from the very first of the church fathers, the, the saints who literally learned the faith from the apostles. Because remember, the entire, almost the entire church in those days were Jews. That's not strictly true, but it's close to true. Um, obviously, the first pope was a Jew. Um, the, the first, um, certainly the first 5,000 Christians were definitely Jews, but a high percentage of the early Christians were Jews. In fact, and I'll get to this near the end of my talk, the first crisis in the early church was um, it, it required the first church council, the Council of Jerusalem in 51 AD, to decide what was the question that was a great crisis in the early church. It was, are we, are we to allow non-Jews into the church, or is the church only for Jews? Literally. You can, you'll find that in the book of Acts, chapter 15. Literally, are we allowed to let non-Jews into the church, or is it only for Jews? You can see where this mistake came from, right? Because Jesus was a Jew, the apostles were all Jews, uh, the 3,000 who came in at Pentecost Sunday were all Jews. So anyway, the, the church fathers had a very, had a very clear, uh, like, um, how can I put it? They saw the light of Christianity in a, in, a, in a light that was very rooted in the Old Testament in Judaism. So since their day, they always saw the story of the Exodus from Egypt as a parable of Christianity. The Jews' slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt was a picture of, of humanity's slavery to the power of Satan. The um, raising up Moses to be their deliverer was obviously a picture of raising up Christ to deliver humanity. The Jews were freed from the power of Satan by what? By passing through the waters of the Red Sea. That was a picture of passing through the waters of baptism which free you from the chains of Satan, right? Then the Jews wandered through the desert for 40 years on the way to the Promised Land. That was a picture of the Christian wandering through the 40 or 80 years of this life on the way to the true Promised Land, of course, heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem. And what sustained the Jews during those 40 years in the, crossing the desert? The miraculous bread from heaven, the manna in the wilderness, which of course was a picture of the Eucharist. And no one less than Jesus himself, of course, in John 6, makes it very clear that the manna in the wilderness was a picture of the Eucharist. I'll, um, uh, in John 6, he said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, but they died nonetheless. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Do you see? So the whole, the whole central event in, in Judaism was in, its, was in itself, in its, in its entire body, a picture of the coming of Christianity. Now, um, I'm going to just skip to the end here because I want to get on to kind of another topic, but um, the, the entire story in, of, of the Exodus from Egypt was a picture of Christianity to come in Christianity. Among Jews, the entire picture of the story from the Exodus from Egypt is a picture of the coming of the Messiah. This is in Jewish theology, 100% kosher Jewish theology. It's so deeply rooted in Jewish theology that Jewish theology states that when the Messiah comes, he has to come on Passover because Moses was the first redeemer of the Jewish people and the Messiah will be the true redeemer of the Jewish people. So since the first redeemer, who is a picture of the true redeemer, came on Passover, the true redeemer, the Messiah, is going to have to come on Passover.
there's a reason why Good Friday had to happen on Passover. Okay, because, because the, entire, the entire story of Judaism, so to, so to speak, um, made, came to a crescendo with the coming of Christ. And that crescendo was foreshadowed in the story of Passover and in the Passover celebration. There are so many parallels. Just, I don't want to push this too hard. I don't want to offend anyone, especially, you'll see what I, where I'm going. But as I said earlier, if a Jew doesn't eat of the Passover lamb, he loses his salvation. He loses his share in the world to come. Does that mean that if a Christian doesn't eat, of, doesn't consume the Eucharist, he loses his salvation? Of course not. But, but participating in the Eucharist is the ultimate gift of participating in salvation. Everywhere you look. Uh, even even uh, manna, the manna in the wilderness, the, in, in the Talmud, which is, which is hardcore Jewish theology, I don't know if any of you know what the Talmud is, but it's basically, it's like, it's like um, the magisterium, it's like the written down magisterium of the Catholic Church for Judaism. The Talmud asks the question, when the Messiah comes, will, um, will manna resume? And the answer is yes, after the Messiah comes. There's no manna in this age, but after the Messiah comes, the manna will resume. And most interestingly, in the Talmud, it asks the question, it says, well, all the sacrifices in the temple have ceased, right? They ceased in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. Um, there are, in the Old Testament, there are lots of sacrifices. There's the wave offering, there's the blood offering, there's the sin offering, there's the thanksgiving offering. The, the Jewish theology asks, after the Messiah comes, will the offerings resume? The answer, no, the only offering which will resume after the Messiah comes is the thanksgiving offering. What's Eucharist mean? Thanksgiving. So anyway, Okay, I'm going to have to switch chapters or, or, or tapa dishes or something to something else. Um, but um, <laughs> where? Okay. Um, okay, so, okay, so that was basically, that whole talk was kind of the role of Judaism, the relationship between Judaism and the Catholic Church leading up to the coming of Christ, you could say. So now the question is, um, what is... What, okay, the big mystery, uh, um, the big mystery is, okay, Christ came, the majority of the Jewish people rejected him, they seem to have failed, right? Their mission was to bring Christ to the world, and yet they did not receive him. So the first immediate response is to think, oh, well, they failed. Uh, a second look says they couldn't possibly have failed because they were chosen to bring about the incarnation of Christ, and it came about and they were chosen to spread the faith in Christ throughout the world, and it has been spread throughout the world. So by definition, they succeeded. But what about the mystery of their failure to recognize him when he came? And um, for that, I'm just going to turn, because I, uh, <laughs> I don't want to run out of time. I'm going to turn to uh, Romans 11. This is, this is my imitation Protestant preacher, I guess, uh, talk of the mission. And uh, I, hope, I hope it's not too painful. But I want to turn to Romans 11 because Romans 11 is the most beautiful exposition of two mysteries. One mystery is why did the Jews reject Christ? And basically, look, the, the overarching, uh, overarching arch you need for everything is that everything in salvation history is divine providence, okay? Nothing goes wrong. There's no plan B. There's no, oh, if only this, then, you know, things would have worked out differently or things would have worked out better. Divine providence is fully capable of taking care of everything it wants to take care of. And there's nothing it wants to take care of more than the unfolding of salvation history. I hope I'm not in trouble, Father, with that. Okay, good. So, so anyway, so um, the Jews' failure to recognize Christ one would like to think is actually a part of divine providence. So let me, with that backdrop, turn to uh, Romans 11. This is, of course, St. Paul speaking. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. 
I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought? The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see, and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Okay, that's pretty mysterious, right? That certainly sounds like divine providence, right? I'll re repeat those last few verses. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see, and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Okay? That certainly sounds like this was divine providence, that this was part of God's plan. It wasn't just the stubbornness and hard-heartedness of the Jews which kept them from recognizing Jesus. It was, as St. Paul is saying, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, and so forth. Fortunately, St. Paul goes on to explain why God did this. So I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means, but through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Okay, so again, I'm going to just go through this a little bit. Have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Their trespass means riches for the world. Their failure means riches for the Gentiles. Their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. Four times in those few verses, St. Paul repeats the same thing. The, the failure of the Jews to recognize Jesus was necessary for the church to be propagated throughout the world, right? I'm not making this up. That's one of the reasons I'm not using notes, but I'm using, you know, printed Bible. I'm not adding a word. I'm subtracting words. I'm skipping paragraphs and stuff, but I'm, I'm not adding a word. It's perfectly clear. If the Jews had all followed Jesus, the church could not have spread properly throughout the Gentile world. St. Paul will, uh, now wh what's he referring to there? Why could the church not have spread per, uh, properly throughout the Gentile world? I think that was already kind of mentioned a little bit earlier that, you know, what was the first crisis in the church was are we allowed to let Gentiles into the church? Um, that required the, the Council of Jerusalem, the very first ecumenical council, all of the apostles had to return to Jerusalem to decide this thorny issue are we allowed to let non-Jews into the church? Now, um, so because up until that point, some of the apostles, including St. Peter, by the way, thought that if a Gentile wanted to enter the church, he had to sacramentally become Jewish first, which, um, <laughs> since it requires uh, circumcision, I like to say it would have had a crippling effect on the early church. Um, but anyway, it would have had a crippling effect on the early church. It would have made it absolutely impossible for the church to spread properly throughout the world. Um, the, the, um, now, theologically, the, the problem was solved at the first church council because they decided we are allowed to let Gentiles into the church without them becoming Jews first. But practically, it was solved by the failure of the Jews to enter the church because within a few years, the church was visibly Gentile, right? It couldn't look like you had to be Jewish to be in the church because half the church was non-Jewish, two-thirds of the church was non-Jewish, three-quarters of the church was non-Jewish, and so forth. But if the five million Jews around uh, Jerusalem and Judea at the time of Christ had all flooded into the church, the suggestion is that wouldn't have happened. So back to uh, Romans. Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. If their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean, okay? So if the Jews' failure to enter the church was a blessing, how much greater blessing when they enter the church? Continuing, if for their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Again, if their rejection meant the reconciliation of the world, the reconciliation of the Gentile world to God through the church, 
what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? It'll be an even greater blessing. Um, and then St. Paul goes on with his uh, central image of the olive tree of salvation. I, I don't know if I, it's not fair for me to say, am I losing you? This is too, too academic. I used to make you laugh and I'm not making you laugh tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm doing my best, but I can't find a lot of punchlines in this. Um, so he goes on to the central image of the olive tree, the olive tree of salvation. So you have this olive tree of salvation. It's, it's planted in Judaism. The trunk is Judaism. It's a cultivated olive tree. The original cultivated olive branches were the Jews. And then he goes on to say, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember, it is not you that support the root, but the root that supports you. You will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but do not become proud, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. And even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? Okay, it's pretty heavy, but it's also pretty clear, okay? You have this olive tree of salvation. The original, it was Judaism. The original branches were the Jews. Some of them were break, broken off to make room to graft in wild olive branches. Those are the Gentiles in the church. If you're one of those grafted in wild olive branches, there might be a temptation to boast over the broken off original olive branches. You know, I was more important than you. God broke you off to make room for me. But um, if you're tempted to, don't, because if they do not persist in their unbelief, they will be grafted back in again, and when they are, they will be even better suited to the tree because they are, were originally a part of it. They were cultivated olive branches and not wild olive branches. Now, don't blame me. I'm just reading St. Paul. But, but that is, you see this picture that's emerging, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but the picture that's emerging is that salvation first came to the Jews, then the Jews were put off to the side, and the Gentiles were brought in. And then when, after the Gentiles are brought in, the Jews will be brought back in again, and then the, ch the church composed of Jew and Gentile will be ready for the second coming. And it will be, I hate to say this, but I, I'm just taking it from St. Paul, it will be better because it's composed of Jew and Gentile, right? If their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? In that verse I just read. Now St. Paul is about to make what I just said uh, explicit. I I'm not making any of this up. <laughs> Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Again, the plan is first the Jews, then no Jews, the Gentiles, then Jews and Gentiles, and then the second coming. Um, as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. So again, I'll just read that first clause. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. As regards the gospel, they're enemies of God, right? They rejected Christ, they rejected the gospel. But it's for your sake, it's for the sake of the Gentiles. It's just St. Paul saying, again, not me. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. So the election of the Jews still continues. Um, St. Paul, John Paul II brought this front and center, right? Um, when he said, you know, anyway, I don't want to go down there now. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were, now, I don't want to say listen carefully, but this is, this is really the money quote that explains why God arranged things this way. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, 
they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. Okay, I'll just go through that. Just as you were once disobedient to God. Um, in other words, the Gentiles were out of relationship with God when Christ came. That's what he means by disobedient to God. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy, have come into relationship with God, because of their disobedience, because of the Jews' failure to follow Christ. So they have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he may have mercy upon all. In other words, when Christ came, the Jews were in relationship with God. If they had immediately entered the church, they would not have passed through a period of being out of relationship with God, a period of disobedience. They would have entered the church saying, ha ha, aren't we wonderful? This is no, no more than we deserve by being so faithful. And you see this attitude in the New Testament, right? The Gentiles, that wasn't a danger because they didn't know God and all of a sudden they knew God, so they knew it was a sovereign act of the mercy of God. But the Jews also had to be taught that it was, would be a sovereign act of the mercy of God. So they had to pass through a period of disobedience so that when they entered the church, it would be obvious to them also that it was a sovereign act of the mercy of God and nothing they could possibly have earned or deserved. As St. Paul said, God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. God wanted salvation to be a sovereign, free, act of mercy undeserved by anybody and so everybody had to come into it from a position of disobedience. The Gentiles were came into it, they were out of relationship with God so they, there wasn't a danger there. The Jews were in relationship with God so there was a tremendous danger there so they had to be drawn through a period of disobedience so that when they came in uh, they would know also it was a sovereign act of the mercy of God. Now I'm going to put a little needle in here, there's another line in here, another clause in here, which is extremely interesting. Um, you were once disobedient to God, the Gentiles. Remember, there's the letter to the Romans, by the way, so it might as well be called the letter to the Gentiles, because that's what Romans mean in this context. Um, Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience. In other words, the Gentiles owe the mercy they've received to the Jews, they now, so that they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. In other words, as salvation came to the Gentiles through the Jews, God wants salvation to come to the Jews through the Gentiles. Okay? And if anything is going to bring about the conversion of the Jews as needed for the second coming, it's not going to be me preaching to synagogues. It's going to be the prayers of good Catholics because that's God's plan, right? I'll just repeat that. So that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. And I'll, I'll go back to a, another line that I skipped over. I, I didn't skip over it, but I read it quickly because I wasn't going to stop there at the time. Um, Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Okay? It's what I said last night. The way that you evangelize a Jew is make them jealous of what you have in the church. Amen? Amen. Okay. So um, I don't want to overstay my welcome. So I think what I'll do now, and, and this has been pretty dense, right? I've been kind of, you know, this has been like, you know, machine gun barrage or something. Um, uh, by the way, I'm very grateful that it's going to be up on the up on the, the uh, website of the cathedral. So, so um, if it went by too fast, you know, you can rerun it. Um, so, what do I want to do now? I think what I want to do now is I will um, I, uh, I I I'm not closing now, but I'll take questions and see where the questions lead because I think that this you know, information dump has been more than enough, but I will say that I did not add a word to Romans 11, seriously, as the, I mean, I'm not, I'm more scared of her than of God, so as the Blessed Virgin Mary is my witness. Um, what I did was I skipped verses because St. Paul, just like I go down side alleys, St. Paul goes down side alleys, 
And if you don't skip verses and you go down all the side alleys and then come back to the mainstream, it's awfully hard to figure out where the mainstream is going. So I did skip verses, but I did not add a word. So anyway, if there are any, any questions? Am I allowed to say, uh oh? <laughs> Is that loud enough? Um, so I was wondering, going back to the first night, um, you had mentioned that in your witness testimony that you you were able to see very clearly all the time that you had wasted not doing things that were of value in the eyes of heaven. And I was wondering if you could expand, if, if you're comfortable expanding a little bit on what those things are that you were wasting your time on, just in the sense of like, if, if, if you're making the comparison that life is our desert wanderings for the Gentiles, I guess, for Catholics, how can we do, how can we not waste our time and do things that are of value in heaven, if that makes sense? Um, first of all, everyone, th oh, thank you for the question. I'll repeat it for the whatever, for the recording or whatever. But the question is, um, in my witness testimony, I mentioned realizing in my theophany, in my experience of God, that I, the, all the regret I would have after I died for every hour I did nothing of value in the eyes of heaven. Um, and you want to know some examples of that? Um, I think the time I spent in dating bars probably wasn't something that got me a lot of points. Um, <laughs> it's not hard, come on, it's not hard to know what's not of value in the eyes of heaven. Um, I will say you have to be a little careful about that preaching or whatever because we all have a duty in life, right? And we're not all freelance evangelists and we're not all priests. And if you're a mother, your primary duty is raising your children for heaven, right? And if you're a father, your primary duty is raising your children for heaven and supporting the family. So, you know, stamping out widgets on an assembly line is doing something of value in the eyes of heaven if that's your duty. Your primary duty for heaven is, is your responsibility that's been given to you as part of your vocation. So it doesn't mean that you know, you're supposed to ignore that. It, it's the opposite of that. But, um, but I'll, I'll just stick with dating bars, okay, for, for an example. It's, it's easy enough to, to you know, know what's, what, um, what they are. I mean, everything I was doing essentially was just for my own pleasure. Even the downhill skiing, you, I mean, in a way, downhill skiing, I mean, a healthy recreation is something of, of value, it can be something of value, but I really exaggerated it. I mean, I, you know, I, I live for downhill skiing and seeing how fast you can slide on snow isn't intrinsically something of value to heaven and so forth. So anyway, that's the best I can do there. I'm amazed at how you were able to bring all these parallels and, and express this to us. I'm wondering what kind of research did you do to get to the point where you are now to put all this together? When did it start and what did you do to arrive at this? Okay, so the question is, what did I do to arrive at the point where I put all these things together? And the answer is, is um, for, um, look, I, I don't know how to do anything except be honest, so I'll just be honest. Look, I was a Harvard Business School marketing professor. I found out about God. I found out about what was important. I had no interest anymore in teaching Harvard MBAs how to make more money, as I said. That career dribbled out because Harvard was able to see my lack of interest. But. Um, I had consulting clients, and I was getting consulting fees, which were the consulting fees of a Harvard Business School professor. So I could live, actually, and I was unmarried at the time, I could live pretty comfortably on 20 or 30 days of consulting a year, and I spent all my time, I knew this was the real stuff, so I just spent all my, and I'm, I'm obviously an intellectual to some extent, I spent all my time reading, you know, reading saints, spending time at monasteries, spending time at shrines, um, you know, reading scripture. And I did that for like almost 20 years, like 17 years or something. Um, and so I just absorbed a lot. I just absorbed a lot, that's all. 
uh, mostly j just from reading. I, I was kicked out of, <laughs> I was kicked out of, I went to Catholic seminary, but I was kicked out of there after one semester. Um, <laughs> so anyway, what, what can you do? Um, I won't, I, prom I really will not say why, but um, it wasn't because of my own misbehavior. Um, but anyway, so, so I, you know, I was, I was self-taught, but, you know, and the other thing is, you know, if you, if you read, man, if you read saints, you know, just read saints, this stuff is inescapable. It's absolutely inescapable. Um, you know, I, I haven't said anything that, you know, that the church fathers did not say over and over and over again, I think, so. Yes? From what you've uh, related to us, I, I'm making the inference that Christ will not return until the Jews are converted to Catholicism. So when that happens, we need to get ready real quick. Yeah, that's a very good inference to make. Um, the, um, uh, it's, it's an inference. It's also a statement in the Catechism of the Catholic Church which makes it pretty official doctrine, paragraph 674, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. Um, that paragraph in the catechism, uh, you know, they footnote what scripture verses is based on, and that's footnoted to two scripture verses. One is this one that I read, lest you be wise in your own conceits, brethren, I want you to understand this mystery a hardening has come upon part of Israel until his, until his, <laughs> until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. That's one of the quotes. The other quote is, oh, um, Jesus, um, during the Passion, or just before, it says, if men are like this, when the wood, no, that's not it. Um, I don't remember the other one, so there. But anyway, it's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And um, I, uh, I, I remember I closed yesterday with a prayer from the First Vatican Council. And it was, I said it was promulgated by two Jewish twin brothers who were priests. And it was signed by almost all the Council Fathers. The Council Fathers, some of the Council Fathers did not want to sign that, that petition, that prayer. The reason they gave is if we sign this, it'll mean the end of the world. <laughs> if the Jews convert, it means the second coming and the end of the world, and I don't want to be responsible for bringing the end of the world on us. <laughs> they had to be talked out of that position, so I think you're on to something. But that doesn't mean, well, I'll say something else. If, if this was like 1958 or something, you could say, uh, I don't think we're ready for the end of the world, but can any of you honestly say, please <laughs> come quickly. Can any of you not say that at this point? I mean, I mean, um, if things don't turn around, I mean, things either have to turn around or it has to be the end of the world because God creates human souls. One purpose, all of earth exists for one purpose. Uh, actually, the entire physical universe exists for one purpose, the creation of human souls to be in bliss and love with God for all eternity in heaven. That's the only reason God created anything in the physical world. It's the only reason he created the physical world. When the creation of human souls doesn't have much of a chance of them ending up in heaven, it's definitely time to wrap things up, right? Because he's not in the business of creating human souls for hell. So I think we have, I mean, I wouldn't be worried about praying for the conversion of the Jews. He might really want us to at this point because it might be coming on time, but it might not be also. It might be another 2,000 years, who knows. Anyway, any other questions before I may say more stupid things? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, two questions, if I may, and I promise the second one will be easy. Um, your journey to conversion is extraordinary, uh, especially your encounter, for lack of a better word, with the Virgin Mary. Um, I don't know if you might have asked her, but uh, why do you think you were, or why were you, why did Mary choose you to appear? And the second question? <laughs> no, I mean, I'll answer that, but 
but uh, you know, I, you know, I don't want to be in suspense. What's the second question? Second question is, when you were conversing with her, was it in English or French? When I was conversing with her, what? Was it in English or French? Oh, was it was in English and French, okay. Okay, so two questions. Why did Mary choose me, and was I speaking to her in English or French? Why not Hebrew, huh? Never mind. I don't, I mean, in other words, that's her first language. But anyway, um, the, uh, I think that at the beginning of my talk, I, I gave an answer to why I was chosen. I mean, in other words, in other words, being chosen is not a reflection on the virtue of the person chosen, right? Um, I think that I worked out well. I think that I, I don't want to say I was a good choice, but you know, I think the fact that I had been a Harvard Business School professor, actually it was at the time, but you know, now had been one, you know, it gives me some credibility to certain communities. Um, you know, I can look back and I can see how everything in my past has enabled me to do this job well and was in fact arranged in order to do that. Even teaching at Harvard Business School, by the way, is, is, is why it's easy for me to speak to a crowd or whatever. It's, you know, I, that's where my training came from. So I think everything, you know, they, they did a good job of weaving my life experiences together so that I'd be able to do this job. But I think somebody just had to do this job. And I think it's an awfully important job because, because, because there's not a whole lot that's more important than the second coming. And the second coming needs the conversion of the Jews and um, there used to be a lot of movement in the Catholic Church to pray for the conversion of the Jews, but it really has uh, dried up a lot in the last 60, 70 years. And I think that it's a good thing for it to get a little bit of a boost. Um, the, uh, the other thing about, uh, did she speak to me in French? No, it was English. Um, and I will say that some there was a lot of speaking there. There was a lot of speaking there. There were a lot of words that I heard through what I thought were my ears. But there were also some intellectual visions, like in the first experience, some things that I saw um, that weren't put into words. Um, for instance, when she recited that prayer in Portuguese, I knew without being told that the reason it was in Portuguese was to reflect a certain piety of the, of the Portuguese people, a certain childlike confidence in Mary that they had retained to a large extent. Um, and when I saw that she was the conduit of all of the grace that flows from divinity into humanity, that wasn't something that came in words. That was something that I saw in an intellectual vision. I don't know how to put it. So it wasn't all words, but the words that, there, that what was in words was in English. So anyway, next. Feeling like I need to take action. What have you learned through your experiences that allows you to let go of what's happening in our world politically, et cetera, and not worry? Or should we view following our desires to actively affect change, in other words, fight for our Catholic values as a way to earn our spot in heaven? Okay, so excellent question. Um, and I would say, and I defer, I mean, I defer to, you know, the priests here and, and anybody else, I mean, anybody in genuine authority in the church. But I would say that we really have one job to focus on, and that is our own sanctity, our own relationship with God, our own basically turning away from sin and growing in holiness. And if we focus on that, um, other things will fall into place. And as soon as we worry about other things, we're not focusing on that. So I think that, uh, you know, we're not gonna save the world. We're not going to um, get votes to be counted legitimately. You aren't, and I'm not. Let's hope someone out there might someday. Um, you know, 
everything that you worry about that you have no influence over is simply a distraction from what you should really be worrying about, which is what God has put on your plate. And what God has put on your plate is, you know, is, is your sanctification, your getting to heaven, your daily duty, your getting your family to heaven, your evangelizing to the extent that you can put other people on the right track and so forth. You know, he hasn't, you know, he hasn't made me a Supreme Court justice or he hasn't made me a, you know, I don't know, a, a CIA house cleaner or something. You know, it doesn't make any sense to, to be distracted. I mean, it's good to be distracted in order to pray for things, sure. Um, and it's good to know I actually think it's good to know how bad the state of the world is, to tell the truth. Um, I, I just think it's good to be in the truth somehow. You're stronger if you're in, in if you're living in a fictional world, it, it makes you weaker in some sense. And if you're living in the real world, which in today means being aware of the incredible ubiquitousness of corruption all around in the institutions which are not supposed to be corrupt the institutions that are supposed to be enforcing justice, in fact, being some of the most corrupt institutions. I think that kind of helps because it helps keep you centered because you know you're not crazy and everything kind of makes sense in a new way. But it's not a place where you're gonna do any good. Uh, the only place where you're gonna do good is in your relationship with God and doing what he tells you. I hope, well, anyway, that's, I know you didn't ask the question, somebody else did, but so that's my response to that person. There's somebody way back there in the back, back pew. I think I probably should make this the last question because it's um, eight o'clock and then I will uh, close with a prayer for the conversion of the Jews. And I have more of those prayer cards downstairs if you want um, the Edersteyn prayer card with the prayer for the conversion of the Jews on back. But anyway, the, the question? I'm sorry if you, um talked about this yesterday. I wasn't here yesterday, but my question is, what was the development of your prayer life like after your experience? What was the development of my prayer life after my experience? Um, it's, it's been all downhill since there. Uh, I don't know if development is the right word. You know, look, I mean, that was a, that was a very special gift and I was kind of um, rocketed into the stratosphere of prayer. I didn't even know what prayer was. I thought, that I, I thought every Catholic had prayer like that, you know? Um, and it was very easy for me to uh, go into meditation and very easy for me to go into contemplation. And um, over time, it, um, it faded. It just faded. Um, so now I have um, an ordinary, I mean, or I think a, a typical prayer life, I will say, and I hope this is true, I, I don't want to be obnoxious, but um, I really think that most Catholics get some consolation in prayer. You know, they get some peace from praying the rosary, they get some peace from receiving communion, they get some peace from Eucharistic adoration. There is a supernatural element, I think, in most people's prayer life. It's just not like they're on tap to turn a faucet. But um, I think that most Catholics in a state of grace, if you look back over the past month or two, there'll be, there'll be moments of special grace and prayer. Um, but anyway, I think I just have a normal prayer life. So, um, uh, but by the way, I will say that this, one of the reasons this is so wonderful, I mean, I love doing this and I love whatever this is, evangelizing, because there is a grace to that also. Um, Okay, I'm going to close with something that resembles a joke, and I, I hope I'm not doing wrong. But you see, the thing is, the wonderful thing about evangelization is that God has arranged salvation to be a pyramid scheme, you know, like Tupperware. If, if, you, if you evangelize somebody, and they get turned on to the faith, and they turn around and evangelize somebody else, you not only get a commission on your friend's evangelization, but you get a commission on the person that they evangelized, and so forth and so on, all the way down the road. So um, anyway, so it's a wonderful privilege to be able to do this. 
That's what you get if you bring a Jew into the church, right? You turn salvation into a Tupperware scheme. But anyway, uh, but it's true. It's actually true, right? If you stop to think about it, it's really true. It's, it is, um, um, <laughs> as I said before, we have two jobs to, to grow in holiness ourselves to, or to get to heaven ourselves, depending on how you want to look at it, and to help other people grow in holiness. And the truth is, <laughs> I don't want to spill the beans for, uh, for any you know, priests who are listening, but the truth is it can be a lot easier to encourage others to grow in holiness than to grow in holiness yourself. So anyway, I know that from my own experience at least. Anyway, so this is a different prayer for the conversion of the Jews, but it's also 100% kosher. It's from the breviary, the Catholic breviary, the old Catholic breviary, for the week of Christian unity in January. Day six of the week of Christian unity used to be dedicated to praying for the conversion of the Jews. It isn't anymore, unfortunately. But this is the prayer from the breviary for that day. O oh God, who manifests your mercy and compassion towards all peoples, have mercy upon the Jewish race from the beginning, your chosen people. You did select them alone out of all the nations of the world to be the custodians of your sacred teachings. From them, you raised up prophets and patriarchs to announce the coming of the Redeemer. You will that your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, should be a Jew according to the flesh, born of a Jewish maiden in the land of promise. Listen to the prayers we offer you today for the conversion of the Jewish people. Grant that they may come safely to a knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah foretold by their prophets, and that they may walk with us in the way of salvation. Amen. Amen, and thank you, and I think Father will close with a prayer. On behalf of the parish, I, I thank you for, for being here and uh, for all you've shared with us these last few days. And uh, it's been very much uh, enlightening and, and very much appreciated. Thank you.